Hello and God bless you, brothers and sisters. My name is Reverend Jared Reed Smith, and I'm a minister here at the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, where my pastor is, Dr. Johnny Calvin Smith. God bless you and thank you for joining me here for our Sunday School Overview. Now, of course, we would love you to be a part of the teaching ministries here at the Mount Moriah Church. On Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., we have in-person Sunday school. That's at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Immediately following at 11 a.m., we go into our morning worship experience. On Wednesday at 7 p.m., we have our adult Bible study, Finding Time with God. Our pastor, Dr. Smith, is taking us through the book of Mark. Please be my guest. You can join us in person at the church or if you're not able to join us, you can join us via a live stream on our social media outlets. If you'd like to be a blessing to the Mount Moriah Church, there is a link in the description of this video, video where you can give according to that which God has placed upon your heart. God bless you. Let's get into God's word. But before we do, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, how we do say thank you. Thank you, God, for everything. Lord, I pray that you please bless your word like only you can. It's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our lesson for today comes from the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verses 7 through 17. Our lesson topic is Jonah runs and is found out. Brothers and sisters, our lesson outline, verses 7 through 9, a huge problem. Verses 10 through 12, a frightening prospect. Then verses 13 through 17, a shocking resolution. Now, when we get into the book of Jonah, it's very paramount that we get a brief understanding. I'll make it very brief on who is the person Jonah. Now, Jonah is a minor prophet in characterization of the books of the Bible. He is seen as a minor prophet. When I categorize, I should say rather, the books of the Bible, he is minor prophet. As our pastor helps us to understand, not minor versus major in the sense of importance, but just looking at maybe the length, uh, a brevity of the message. And so Jonah had a very special assignment. God chose him uh, to preach a warning message to the city of Nineveh. And that is one of the most prominent cities of Assyria. Assyria was an evil empire with a brutal army. And you know from studying the Bible that Assyria had a very unpleasant relationship with God's people when you think about the history of God's chosen people. And so other nations, one thing you need to know about Jonah or the prophecy that Jonah received from God is these other nations had prophecies directed against them. But Jonah, it was one that was commissioned to go and give a very direct message from God. And because of the wickedness of the people of Nineveh, Jonah did not want for uh, the people to see and understand and, and, and have the experience of God's mercy. And brothers and sisters, when we are not willing to share what God has called for us to do, we can be just as guilty as Jonah. We ought to be telling a dying world about the saving power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so they can experience the grace and mercy of our God. And so we see in our text that Jonah is going to be given a direct assignment or task from God. I'm in chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and he said very specifically, God says, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city and cry against it for the wickedness is come up before me. But instead, Jonah is going to rise up and flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And so he is going to go, as many preachers will help us understand, in the direct opposite way in which God wanted for him to go. And brothers and sisters, when we are, you might as well say that you're going the opposite direction when God has called for us to do something and you refuse, you're doing the same exact thing. When we are not willing to tell others or not willing to 
do what God has called for us to do, we're going in the direct opposite way, just like Jonah. So what does he do? He flees uh, unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This was his total aim. This is what he did. So we see the what is that he went and he tried to flee from the presence of the Lord. The reason why he did it, we see in Jonah chapter four later on, we will see if you want to continue to read that he did not want them to experience God's mercy. And so sometimes, brothers and sisters, we can be uh, so mm, judgmental that we want to hog the mercy of God. Well, it's his mercy to dis dispense, not ours. It's his to give out, not ours. And so he goes and he's found, he's going to a ship and going to Tarshish according to chapter uh, chapter one, verse three. But we see that he goes and he gets into the ship going to Tarshish. He buys his fare and he went down into it. And so not only is he trying to flee from the presence of the Lord by going in the direct opposite way, but he also gets into the ship going the opposite way. Oh, I wish y'all help me. But not only does he get into the ship, but he goes to the bottom of the ship. Let me tell y'all, brothers and sisters, that what I've come to understand that you can run, but you can't hide because God sits high and he looks low. So how dare you think that you can go in the opposite direction of my will, get into a ship and go to the bottom of the ship. Am I in your text right now? I'm in chapter one, verse three. He says he paid his fare and went down into it, into it. He tries to go to the bottom of the ship and hide. Well, Psalm 139, I believe around verse seven tells me I can't go away from his presence. I can, whether shall I go from thy presence? I can't escape the omnipresent eye of God. He is here, there, and everywhere. God is omnipresent. But I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that when we are not following in the will of God, we are just as guilty as Jonah. So we dare not look bad at Jonah. We can learn a couple of lessons for application in your lesson. I'm going to try not to preach too much, but oh, I, I feel my help coming along. Look at verse four. And we see, I haven't even got into our text today. I'm looking at my time. Look at verse four. But while he's in the bottom of the ship, which we'll see later on that he's in their sleep, the text says that the Lord sent out a great wind. Not osmosis, not a coincidence, not an accident or an incident. This is the omnipotent hand of God. Oh, I don't know why I'm about to preach. This is the omnipotent hand of God. Verse four, you can't flee from my presence, but I'm going to tell you something else. I'm in charge of every event of this world. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the attention of you, Jonah, because even though I'm learning that you're going to be asleep here in a second, because that's what it tells me in verse five, uh, you're going to be in a ship with some other people, some other people that are on the ship with you, according to verse five, and they're going to be afraid. And I want to put an emphasis here that as these uh, mariners, they're going to be praying to their gods, little G-O-D, verse five. They're going to be praying to their gods and they're going to cast forth different things to try to offset the, the shiftness of this tempestuous wind that is going on. And while they're trying to do all of that, you're down in the boat sleep. And sometimes when we're insensitive to God's will, we have the nerve to be asleep while he's moving. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, God knows how to get our attention. Oh, I think I'm I think I'm saying something. God knows how to get our attention. And so as I build up just trying to get to verse seven, verse six, they looking around, everyone in there, these shipmasters and the captain of the ship, and they're saying, Well, uh, whose reason? Why why is this going on? And and and, and where is where is that one? Uh, that that they, they call Jonah. Where is he? What meanest thou to be sleep? They're looking for him. And, and Jonah is now, according to verse five and verse six, he's sleeping. So they wake him up in verse six. 
And so now they're trying to figure out why is it that we have experienced this rough wind and water. So verse seven, now we get in our text and I promise I'll go faster. Verse seven says, and they said everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause the evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Not only am I omnipotent, uh, I'm omnipresent, I'm omniscient, all of these together. I control every event. This is not a coincidence. This is my power at hand. So the lot cast upon Jonah. And so they asked him a series of questions in verse eight. Who are you? What's your occupation? Now, Jonah could have lied in verse nine, but Jonah tells the truth. I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. So verse 10, then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of Lord. These men who were praying to their own God in verse five knew more about the power of God, I believe, than Jonah did according to the text. They say, you're the one, your God has done this. Jonah, you should have known how powerful your God is because you just, you just said that he's the God of heaven, which made the sea and made the dry land. So they already picked up on how powerful the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. So look at verse 11. Then said they unto him, what shall we do unto thee? Uh, we need this sea to calm down. This is, it's rot, it's tempestuous. This, this, is, oh, this is overwhelming what we're going through. So Jonah says in verse 12, he said, take me and throw me overboard. And they said uh, in verse 13, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. So verse 13, nevertheless, they tried to roll a little bit harder. They tried to beat this wind, but the Bible says, but they could not for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. It even got worse as they were trying to compensate for Jonah's foolishness. Uh, God made it as to where that they could not. And so finally, they come to their senses and realize that they have to do something very drastic. They must take Jonah at his word, but they don't want to be seen as murderers. And so they come from praying to their own God. I believe that was in verse five to now praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in verse 14. Look at it, it says, wherefore they, the same ones in verse five that did not know God, the same ones that were praying to their little G-O-D, now in verse 14, they're praying to the God of heaven's armies. And they say, wherefore they cried unto the Lord. That's capital L, lowercase capital O-R-D. They're praying to God, Jonah's God. And he says, we beseech thee, O Lord. Notice how there's been a shift. See, when you come to understand the power of God, and see, I, I, I might be stretching this thought, but I'm going to say it anyway, that sometimes God uses the events of our foolishness to reveal his power to others. That's what I see in the text. Verse 14, they come to now that they're praying to God and said, we beseech thee. And I got another verse in verse 16 that will back up that claim. Oh Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. In other words, uh, we don't want to be seen as murderers in your powerful eye. So verse 15, so they took up Jonah and they cast him forth into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. Out of nowhere, now that Jonah is gone, the sea has now ceased. Verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now, were their lives forever changed? I don't know. I don't see that in the text. I can't, I, I can just show you that they prayed to the Lord in verse 14. And I can show you in verse 16 that they feared, had reverence for the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice and made a vow. And so we can only understand that they did at least, at the very least, came to understand the omnipotent power of God. And look in verse 17, one of a beautiful verse. Now the Lord had prepared, I love that, a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You ought to be understanding that God uh, not was punishing necessarily Jonah, but he was working in preparing his very disobedient prophet. 
God not only uh, is the fish was not seen as a punishment, but a preserver. God in his omniscient, omnipotent and omnipresent way in his love, grace and mercy. He's not he's not seen in this in this example of punishing Jonah, but preserving Jonah. And I just have a thought that just came to me that I am so glad that God in his providence, God in his sovereignty, God still disciplines his children as he did, but he does not do it at the expense of his love. You ought to be glad and that ought to help us as we deal with each other that we God disciplines his children. Yes, he does, but he does not discipline us as at the expense of his love. You ought to be glad that I can glean from here that this fish was not a punishment because the fish did not kill Jonah. Mm, the fish did not kill Jonah, but the fish was allowed to be providentially there to preserve Jonah so Jonah could come to his right senses. And, and so Jonah at, at the end uh, or at the beginning of chapter two, when God allows you to be spared, and God preserves you when he should be punishing you, you can offer a prayer to the Lord. Oh, I'm getting into chapter two already because what I come to understand that that preservation of that great fish helped me to pray in chapter two. Let me stop this. Let me stop this lesson because I feel good and I'm getting all ready into next week's lesson. You ought to be glad that his punishment was not necessarily punishment, but a preservation tool to prepare him. And that preparation helped him to pray in chapter two. God bless you. May God keep you from the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church family.